Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good evening. And whatever time it is, wherever you are, we're just sending our greetings to you and saying we love you and we're grateful that you are here with us today. And even as we begin by leading you people in a session of worship that is song and dance, um, reach out to someone, tell them welcome to service, have fun, we love you, tell them that it's a month of love and our love is extending beyond borders. So, even as we begin, get up onto your feet, stretch, kick, stretch your arms, as we are about to go into worship, in other words, warfare. So, um, the word of the Lord says, enter his cause with thanksgiving, and we want to thank him for everything that he has done. Are you ready, guys? Yeah. yeah. Come on, let me take your position. Whichever dance move you choose to use, it is acceptable in his courts. Isn't it? No judgment. I come before you today And there's just one thing that I want to say Thank you Lord I just want to thank you Lord For all you've done in my life For all the blessings that I cannot see Every word of worship with one accord 
Every praise, every praise is to our God. Sing hallelujah to our God. Glory hallelujah is to our God. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Let's sing every praise. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship with one accord. Every praise, every praise. that's who you are Lord you are all that and more you are all that and more Lord and even as we worship King we are about to say that you are God Almighty you are almighty all in other words your might supersedes everything your might cannot be contained and we love it, Father. Let's just worship Him. Worship Him in your own way, even at home.
So Father, we stand here, we worship you, we lift up our voices declaring that you, that you Lord are mighty, you are mighty to save, you are mighty to heal. Whatever we are going through Lord, you have gone ahead of us and you, you O oh Lord, have won the fight for us because you deserve it Lord, because it is for you, may your name be lifted on high. So Lord, we thank you. We thank you for all that you are. We thank you for all that you have been. And we are grateful for what we are about to see you do. So Heavenly Father, be lifted on high. And all the saints said, Amen. Amen. And all the saints said, Amen. Amen. Welcome to service. As Captain M is about to take us through this voyage, Tell someone you are welcome in the house of the Lord. Invite them, say hi. Remind them that ah, it's not the destination that makes us, but it is the journey. So we bless you. Wow, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. It is so good here to have you worshiping with us. Wasn't that an amazing time of worship? Thank you, worship team, for leading us in that time. I just want to give you a very special welcome. My name is Pastor M, Senior Pastor of Mavuno Church. And I just want to, uh, everybody who's here, we're so grateful. Wherever you're watching from, whether you're in your house, in the office, whether you're traveling, uh, we're so grateful. 
that you've chosen to come and join us as a family as we worship together. And uh, this is going to be a fantastic service. I'm really looking forward to the things that God has, the exciting word that God has for us. This is there's a great series we're going through, and so I'm so glad you're in church today. And uh, if you are watching this from home, uh, wherever you're watching this from, uh, I'd love you to go online right now. Uh, there's a little... Uh, uh, um, what do you call it, a little form we'd love you to fill. And this is how we are able to track our online congregation and be able to see where you're watching from. So we can begin to pray and maybe even find ways to connect uh, with you wherever you are. So uh, do fill that out. Uh, it's on the screen, the, the, the Mavuno at Home uh, login there. Uh, just go on. It's very quick. It'll just take you a couple of minutes. And you know what? As you do it, uh, it's, so, it's so amazing. We've had people fill this out and then it's proved to be in a place that was close when we're traveling somewhere and we're able to say, hey, we're coming to your city, I uh, would love to get together. It's just a way we can do that. But also as we pray for you and care for you, it helps us know where you are and who you're watching from, uh, where you're watching from. So please fill that out. And it's just a way of saying I belong. And this is a place that I'm part of. Even if you're a visitor and you'd love for us to just be able to pray for you this week, uh, please fill that form. So now, uh, before we go into uh, God's word today, I really want to uh, 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 encourage us uh, because in this year, one of the things that we've challenged our congregation to do is, not, in addition to our regular tithes and our offerings, to give what we call our fast food offering. And what is a fast food offering? It's bringing an equivalent of your first month's income of the year and giving that to God's work. And the way we challenge our people at Mavuno Church, we say this is how we do capital uh, expansion here at, uh, at the church. We use the regular tithes and offerings to run the ministry of the church, but we use our first fruits. Uh, as a way to be able to help us with capital expansion, to be able to put up buildings, to be able to acquire land, to be able to do the things we need to do to plant churches and reach people across the world, to bring God's hope and help to people far from us. And so I want to encourage you, if you haven't yet done it, to go on the Mavuno uh, uh, website. Uh, you'll be able to see a, a, a picture there for, of fruits, and it says first fruit, and you'll be able to make your pledge. If you haven't given it yet, uh, very uh, interestingly, so far, we have about 23 million Kenya shillings pledged so far by God's people. And that's exciting for me, uh, just to see so, so many people have already pledged. Uh, I want to encourage you. I know there's many other people who haven't pledged yet. And I want to encourage you. Uh, it's not too late. Uh, please make your pledge. And then trust God. I think one of the things we've talked about, and we talked about this last month, is that there's nothing like giving to help us grow in our faith. Uh, it really helps us grow in our faith. And I want to challenge you because there's a way Fast Fruits does that uh, for us. And so um, uh, before I pray for us, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 26, and it, it, it says a very interesting thing. Uh, this was when the Israelites uh, were about to enter their promised land. And God gave them this promise in the book of Deuteronomy through the, their prophet Moses. It says, when you've entered the land, the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, and have taken possession of it and settled it. Take some of the first fruits of all that you produce from the soil of the land the Lord your God is giving you and put them in a basket and then go to the place the Lord your, your God will choose as a dwelling for his name. And basically what they were to do is give this to the priest and it was supposed to be used for God's work. And uh, what we want to do is just to say, hey, this is what we do. It's, it's a way that you symbolize. They were symbolizing, you know, the promised land we didn't bring ourselves in. Uh, it's not us who acquired it for ourselves. God is the one who brought us into this space. And by doing this, we're acknowledging everything we have belongs to him. The rest of our produce for the year belongs to him. And he's the one who's going to supply for us. And I want to just encourage us to do that. And as we do that, I really want to trust God for a season of miraculous occurrence. Uh, this is a year when God has promised us acceleration with ease. What's acceleration with ease? What basically this means is that God will accelerate you. Acceleration usually means that you're moving fast. And moving fast usually has stress with it. But the promise God gave us uh, for 2023 as a church is that there'll be acceleration and ease at the same time. And I believe that even as we take this step of faith, that one of the results that many of us will be able to testify, one of the miracles that many of us will experience is acceleration and ease. And so I want to pray for us as we come into a space where we are waiting on God uh, for his word and also as we are giving. So Father, Lord, I just want to thank you for your people. I thank you that, Lord Jesus, we are your people. Uh, you've called us by your name. You've called us to be an amazing community, a people who love you and who love others. You've called us to be ordinary people before an, uh, an amazing, extraordinary God. Uh, people who do fearless exploits and who are fearless influencers in the world you've called us to be in. And I thank you that this is a place where we are equipped. Right now, Lord, I pray for your people that even as we give, 
uh, as we stretch in our faith, as we give of our tithes, our offerings, our first fruits, that Lord Jesus, you will bless us uh, increasingly, abundantly, over and above anything we've ever experienced. I pray that, Father God, you're going to just allow us to see your goodness in the land of the living. I pray for those who may be giving just out of faith. I don't have much, but I'm going to give what I have, and it's a step of faith. And I pray that, Father God, as they give, you're going to grow their faith to understand that they can never outgive God. I pray that, Lord, you're going to raise up kingdom financiers in, in our midst as we grow in our faith to understand that, my goodness, God can trust us with wealth. As we're faithful with little, he's able to give us more that we can be faithful with. And so I bless you, God's people. And I pray now, even as we come into God's word, Father, open our hearts. There's a powerful word you have for us today. Uh, open our hearts. Get us ready for what you have for us. And I'm praying that, Lord, there's going to be healing of relationships. Uh, there's going to be a, 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 a tearing down of curses, of things that have held us back in our relationships. And that, Lord, every one of us is going to experience the goodness of God in our relationships. And so I bless you, God's people, uh, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And God's people say, it, Amen. Amen. Dearly beloved, uh, today we are gathered here to celebrate the wonderful union uh, between Philip and Elizabeth. Kindly join me as we celebrate these wonderful love birds. We are going to be so happy. We are the perfect couple. I'm so glad the traffic wasn't so bad. I can't wait to see her. I hope she looks the same in real life as she does on Instagram. Frank said she was a vibe. What on earth does that even mean? Phil? Whoa, such a gorgeous smile. He has a beard. Yes. Thank, Thank you, you, Frank. I got you hot chocolate. I was told you're hot and chocolate in color. Oh, wow. Thank you. I don't know if that was appropriate. Quick, say something. Why would someone get a hot beverage in this heat? So do you like movies? Failure. Yeah, I love comedies. What? No, I don't. Oh, wow. I like Kevin Hart and all the other guys. I can't stand comedies. Actually, movies is where it's at. Um, so, what are you looking for in a relationship? Someone who is very independent. Someone who I can do everything with. Someone adventurous. Someone who likes to stay at home. Someone who doesn't talk too much. Someone who will listen to all my stories at the end of each day. Someone who makes roughly what I make or less. Someone who isn't intimidated by how much money I make. I hope she wants to travel fast and have kids later. I hope he wants us to have kids and then travel all over with them. <laughs> Someone authentic and with a vibe. Um, me too, me too. Wow, um, it's already five o'clock. Is he bored with me already? Or does he want to save some more for the second date? Should I escort her to a stage or a car? Is that creepy? Is she even going home? Or is she even going elsewhere? Should I hug him or shake his hand? Think, think fast, think fast. She's standing up, she's standing up, boy. Ah, see you soon. Get elsewhere safe. What on earth was that? I like him. I like that he knows I can be going elsewhere apart from home. He must be a feminist. Good morning. My name is Muradi Wanjao or Pastor M, but today you can call me Captain M because I'll be navigating you through the third leg of our cruise to Love Island, which is what we're calling our Salmon Series uh, this month. Now through the series, we've been talking about how most people enter romantic relationships excited about the prospect and it feels like you're on a sweet cruise to a romantic island where you're going to have the time of your life <laughs> but you know as a relationship starts to hit those inevitable speed bumps more and more it feels like you're instead marooned on a desert island now how does this shift happen you know we talked about this haven't we you know it's we walk into this relationship uh every romantic relationship with our box of dreams it's an invisible box but it's there our hopes our desires our innocent longings that we hope will make us happy but before long however we hand this box over to our partners not just as our dreams but as our expectations 
And what we're saying to them now is, it's your job to fulfill my dreams. It's your job to make me happy. And you know what happens when we do that? The biggest casualty of expectations is gratitude. Because whenever he or she does something to you, uh, for you, you figure they owe it to me anyway. I mean, that's their job description. I mean, every husband should do that. Every wife should do that. And that's why we say it. We must enter into relationships knowing that everything we give must be freely given, expecting nothing in return. And that we must practice the attitude of gratitude in our marriages. Now, last week, we cruised a little deeper into deeper waters and we talked about uh, how to get unstuck when we're in that uh, chain of uh, unmet expectations. And we talked about the principle of submission, mutual submission. God wants our marriages to be a model that teaches a watching world the kind of loving submission that we should give to God as God's people. And also, by, and, and basically we say that when a, a wife submits to her husband, as the scripture teaches, that she's demonstrating how we as God's people should submit to God. It's a, it's a demonstration to a watching world. And when a husband dies to his wife, uh, when he puts her needs above his needs, then he's also demonstrating to the watching world how radical Jesus' love is for his church. And every, every, um, every Wednesday night, by the way, I just want to say this uh, for, for my online audience here. Uh, every Wednesday night at 5.30 uh, uh, p.m. East Africa time, we have what we call on the Mavuno YouTube page, we, we call it Family Night. And at Family Night, by the way, we've been sharing examples. We've been going deeper every week. Uh, we take what we talked about on Sunday and we go deeper and we talk about uh, how these things are working in our own marriages. And so if you've never been to Family Night, this is a great month for you to join in family night come this wednesday 5 30 p.m east africa time and bring a friend as well because i believe that this series is saving lives and saving marriages now there's still a question that i'd like us to answer today that we haven't yet answered and that is what are we supposed to do with our box of hopes and dreams and desires i mean we've got our box of dreams and their desires re regarding children. I mean, what kind of children are we going to have? How many are they going to be? How are they going to be raised? All of us walk into it and we have some kind of idea about this. It's a dream about money. And it's like, my goodness, in my dream, I'm talking about money. What kind of resources are we going to have? What kind of house? I mean, what, what kind of lifestyle are we going to have? What kind of jobs? Th th this, this money thing is a big one for couples. By the way, they say money is one of the leading causes of divorce and separation worldwide. And it's a big thing because it's in our dreams, all of us. It's, 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 it's about where we're going to live. We all have a dream about the house, the dream house that we want to live in and what kind of neighborhood we want to live in. We've got a dream about our careers. Let me see if I can find careers in here somewhere. <laughs> yes, right here. You've got a dream about the careers that we want to have. Are we going to be career people? Is, is one of us going to be a stay-home parent? And you know, it's interesting because we come in with our own dreams about these things. These are our deeply held dreams. It's, it's about our lifestyle. What kind of gadgets? What kind of toys? Uh, what kind of cars are we going to drive? And you know, we are coming into this thing with, with a box of, expect, of dreams. Uh, what kind of education are we going to have? And we're walking into this space with deep longings and desires about how relationships should work. Now, the, the problem we say it is when what, these, what seems like very innocent dreams and hopes and desires are interpreted as expectations to the person that I'm with. And soon they become a heavy burden for this person, a burden that is too heavy for them to carry. And here's a problem. Because they were not designed to carry their box, that, my box, they will inevitably let me down. There's no person who can carry the, the weight of my expectations. And here's this spiral that happens in marriage. You have the dream becoming the expectation. And when the expectation is not met, guess what happens? It turns into frustrations. Dreams become expectations, which lead into frustration. I become frustrated because you promised me things that you're not delivering. There's a lifestyle that I expected that I'm not getting. I desired a certain level of intimacy that I'm not getting with you. There's a way I wanted to be treated, uh, to be loved, to be respected. That is not happening. And guess what happens? We are both two people in a marriage and we're both frustrated. And the question we asked ourselves is, what do we do? What do we do in our dreams turn into frustrations? What are we supposed to do with these le legitimate desires that are in our box? Is it too much for a husband to desire a wife who respects him? 
and who speaks with res- in a respectful tone to him? Is that too much really? Is it too much to desire a husband, for a wife to desire a husband who's responsible with money and who treats her like a queen? I mean, what should we do with legitimate desires when our spouse does not seem keen to fulfill these desires? Will our desires ever get met? And if they don't, what are we supposed to do when we're in that space of frustration? And you know, I want to say this. When many couples get into this frustration space, three options. There are three options that they take with their box of dreams. Actually, uh, several options, but I'll, I'll talk about a few of them. The first one is to ignore it. Just ignore the box. I mean, pretend it doesn't exist. Uh, it's like, fine, I'm never going to get it happening, so let me just pretend that this thing doesn't exist. And you know, because what, what I'm really saying is, you know, if I give and give and give and nothing's happening, I'm just going to pretend. Let, let me just live in this life like nothing ever happened. But you know, here's a dangerous thing. What happens is when you don't acknowledge, uh, when, you pre- when you pretend these things aren't there, they're still there. They're underneath the surface. They're still rattling in there. They're in your heart and in your soul. And when you suppress them, they will still find a way to come out. They'll come out as as, as anger, as suppressed anger. They'll come out as bitterness. They'll even come out as illness. And many times what you're going to find is that you're not going to be a healthy person and your relationship has no chance of being healthy. Uh, A second option for the people who choose, okay, fine, I'm not going to ignore it. What they do is I replace it. I replace it. So what I do with my box, I basically put my dreams and my desires into my work, into my kids. I I find out another way to put those dreams and desires into, into sports, into my friends, into hobbies, the things that help me deal with the pain. But here's the thing, as much as these things help me deal with the pain, they don't actually deal with the, the, the elephant in the room that I'm stuck in a relationship that is not working. In fact, this solution of replacing, basically what it does, it even pulls us farther apart because we become nothing more than roommates. And I can tell you that nobody was dying to get married so they can get a roommate. (laughs) There are different reasons we got married and that's not one of them. So it's not fun. And, And so a third option for some people who choose, okay, let's do a different thing, is to push it. So we take our disappointments and our box and we just constantly push it to our spouse. And it's like we nag them. We criticize them. Hey, I hate being frustrated. Honey, we need to talk. Have you ever been told, honey, we need to talk? It's like one of the most stressful things a guy can be told. I mean, we get angry. We shout at the person. We become passive aggressive with them. We withhold affection, kneel by mouth. And it's one of those things where it's like, I'm just punishing you for not giving me what I want. But you know, over time, you're going to realize that even though you might get some quick results, that that model of pushing frustrations to the other person will not ultimately work. Actually, it end up hurting your marriage. It may work briefly, but in the long term, you're actually destroying your marriage. And so many people, when they're stuck with those three options, they figure out the only option left is to leave with my box. And basically, how do you leave with it? Either by having an affair, and so it's like, I'm going to look for somebody else to fulfill this, or by walking out of the marriage altogether. It's like, I'm done. I can't handle it. I mean, you're obviously not giving me what I came here for, so I'm gone. This is not what I signed up for. I can't manage this. Now, the challenge for many people who've done this and who've taken this route, and it's a very common route today, here's a challenge. Let me just tell you what the challenge is. That wherever you go, there you are. What do I mean by that? In other words, when you go with your issues, (laughs) Whatever part of the problem you are causing in the relationship, because every relationship has two people and every problem has, it has two sources. Uh, yours may not be as obvious to you, but there's a place that you are playing. Guess what happens? You're going to take that into your next relationship. So swapping out people doesn't solve anything oftentimes because you're still the same old person who was in that other relationship and you've not changed. And besides that, you still have your heavy box of expectations that you're still going to be asking somebody else to look after for you. And guess what's going to happen with those expectations? They're going to turn into frustration because if the first person couldn't fulfill your hopes and dreams, what makes you imagine that the next one is going to have the capacity to do it? And what makes you dream or think about that? And so here's the thing. That's also not a solution. It's not the way that we should be going. And so what do we do then when we are stuck in this place? When we find that, listen, we're, we're, we're not able to walk away. You're telling me that, listen, I can't, I can't sublimate this. I can't just take it elsewhere. I can't just ignore it. What do I do in that situation? So what are we supposed to do then? How do I deal with my box of frustrations? You know, there's a great example of dealing with frustrations in relationships in 
Psalm 55. And that's a Psalm of David. King David actually wrote this. And let me say something as a disclaimer. This passage is not addressing dating or marriage relationships specifically. It's more of a general friendship text. But it gives us some very insightful advice on what to do when our relationship dreams turn into frustration. I think we can learn some great things from what King David did. And so I want us to read Psalm 55, verse 12, uh, verse 12 and onwards, and just see what this man did. So let me start with verse 12. It's not an enemy who taunts me. I could bear that. It's not my foes who so arrogantly insult me. I could be hidden. I could have hidden from them. Instead, it is you, my equal, my companion and close friend. What good friendship we once enjoyed as we walked together to the house of God. Now, I don't know if you've ever felt like that in a relationship, wounded by someone who you thought should have known better. I don't know, have you ever noticed that the ones we trust the most are the ones who have power to hurt us the most. And that's exactly what's happening here. David is talking to a close friend, a close companion, somebody they, they, they worship God with, somebody they were tight, they were buddies. And then he says, I didn't expect it to be you who would stab me in the back. And then he continues. In fact, later in the passage, if you flip to verse 20, he says this. He says, as for my companion, he betrayed his friends. He broke his promises. His words are as smooth as butter, but his heart is war. His words are soothing as lotion, but underneath are daggers. I mean, talk about betrayal. <laughs> I mean, many have felt this in, in romantic relationships, isn't it? I mean, someone made you a promise to give you the life you desired. Somebody uh, said for better, for worse, they're going to stick with you. But after you got serious, after you got married, they broke that promise. And everybody says the same thing about them. When you talk about them, they say, but he's so charming. He's such a nice guy. But she speaks so kindly. She's so well brought up. What, 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 she can't be that bad. But you're the one who got close enough. You're the one who knew, knows the real person. The words that they say when nobody else is looking. What everybody else sees as a charming person, a beautiful woman, is that unkind person who betrayed you and stabbed you in the back. A cold person. And that was David's reality. And you know, in many ways, David is just like you and me. Because David was a man of war. <laughs> he was a military man. And he knew exactly what to do when he was under attack. What do you do when you're under attack? You fight right back. And that's what David uh, would have been tempted to do. It's not what we do. We do the same thing. When we're with someone and they're hurting us, they're not meeting the end of the bargain, what do we do? We fight right back. And the more pain we felt, the more we fight back. In fact, sometimes we fight them very aggressively. We coerce them. We control them. We manipulate them. We, we raise our voices. We, we power up. We manipulate them until we get what we wanted in the relationship. But when that doesn't work and other people, maybe your personality isn't that kind to do that, we retreat into ourselves. The battle is still there, but it's inside you. And it's raging internally. Why did I ever marry this person? Uh, what was I thinking? Why am I still in this relationship? Will this person ever change? And whether it's an external battle or it's an internal battle, it is raging regarding our unmet expectations and we are frustrated. We are frustrated and stuck in that situation. But here's where David departs from what we expect. Instead of choosing to fight his friend, he goes a completely different route. And I want to warn you right now, even as we're continuing with this message, that the route he chose is completely countercultural and counterintuitive. <laughs> You're not going to find this approach in Ebony Magazine. Uh, 10 ways to make him love you again. You're not going to find it there. You're not going to find it in a relationship podcast. Three steps to make up before Valentine's Day. Uh, you're not going to find it there. Uh, you're not going to find it in a bridal shower. You're not going to find it hanging out with your boys. <clears throat> even if you go to a salon, or listen to a sex therapist, all the places where people get relationship advice, you're not going to get the advice that we're going to read uh, that King David writes. And why is this? The reason is because what he's going to tell you is God's wisdom. And God's wisdom is going to sound very weird. But it's the only proven way to turn your frustration into a lifetime of joy and freedom. So are you ready for it? Like I warned you, this is not going to be easy for you, but I hope you're ready. Because this stuff, it's life-changing. So here's what David does. Let, let me tell you what he does. He picks his box of frustration and he throws it. He throws it to God. He throws it to God. Okay, I know that's not what you're expecting, right? <laughs> it's not what you're expecting. But that's exactly what David does. He takes his box. 
He fills it with all the frustrations he can. And he looks for God and he hurls the box to God with all his might. Listen to what he says in verse 15. He says, let death take my enemies by surprise. Let them go down alive to the realm of the dead for evil finds lodging among them. Now, I mean, first of all, just hold up, hold up. What is David doing? He's talking about his friend who betrayed him. And if he was using 21st century language, the language of today, he'd be saying, to hell with him. <laughs> that's what he'd be saying. That's, a, that's basically what he's saying. Let him go to hell. Let him go to the place of the grave. He's actually saying that. And, 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 and that's exactly what we'd expect someone to say when they are hurt. But here's what's happening. Here's what's weird. David is not saying it to the person who hurt him. He's saying it to God. He's praying one of the most honest, sincere, authentic prayers that you'll ever hear. He's bringing his raw, unfiltered, sincere, authentic prayers to God. He's bringing his pain to God and saying, God, you deal with him because I'm done. I can't handle. I can't deal. Uh, I, I just can't. <laughs> That's what we say in Kenya. I can't. Uh, I'm done. <laughs> and I and, and know here's the thing. If you don't believe that's part of a prayer, just look at verse 16 that follows right after that. He says, as for me, I call out to God. So he's like, like, he's like, let him go to hell. And then he says, verse 16, as for me, I call out on God. And the Lord saves me. Evening, morning, and noon, I cry out in distress. And he, God, hears my voice. What's David saying? He's saying, I pick up my, my box, all my frustrations. And instead of throwing it at my friend, instead of throwing it at my partner, I throw it with all my strength to God. I pray honest prayers about my frustrations. I report this person to God. Now, I suspect that some of you who are listening are saying, really, Pastor M? I mean, you're saying uh, the solution to all my frustrations is prayer? <laughs> I mean, isn't that a typical pastor thing to say? I mean, don't you have a more practical solution for me? But here's the thing. The only reason you're thinking this way is because you've not yet understood the power of God or the power of prayer. Because you've, we've, turned this, we've turned prayer into this religious activity and we've robbed it of the realness and authenticity that is necessary when you make an appeal to the most powerful force in the universe. Because that's what prayer is. I don't know whether you've ever prayed a real prayer to God, a sincere prayer to God, where you've said to God something like, God, I'm so angry with you. Have you ever said that to God? Like, I'm angry with you, God. You're the one who led me into this relationship. And now I'm drowning in it. Have you ever been honest with God and said, God, I'm so tired of this man. I wish I never married him. Uh, uh, or said, God, this woman has let me down so many times. I don't even know what to do anymore with her. Have you ever said to God, I'm so done with this marriage. This woman you gave me, just like Adam said, this man you gave me makes me so angry. And that's what David is doing. He takes his frustrations and as raw, as unfiltered as they were, he throws them directly to God. Now, I want someone in this house to hear this word today. That God is not intimidated by your raw, honest, ugly, untidy prayers. He's not. In fact, I believe that a big part of the reason that David eventually became known in the scripture as the friend of God was because he was extremely honest to God. Through the ups and downs of his life, he had no filters. <laughs> He talked to God, and if you read through the Psalms, the Psalms are his prayers, they're his journal, they're filled with rage, they're filled with longing, they're filled with sorrow, and sometimes with praise. He brought his frustrations, he brought his life to God as it was. And you need to know this, God already knows your frustrations. He already knows what's going on in your relationship. You don't need to pretend or be proper before him in prayer. He knows what's in your box. And in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, he tells us this powerful thing. He says, cast all your anxiety to him. In other words, take your anxieties, take your frustrations, cast them, throw them to God. Why? Because he cares for you. He cares about that unmet desire that you have for intimacy. He cares about that desire you have for companionship, that legitimate desire. He cares about that desire you have for respect from your spouse, for support from them. And he says, he's saying to us, stop taking that pain to someone who is powerless to do anything about it. Your partner can't do anything about it. Your friends can't. They don't have what it takes to help you. Throw that box to the only one who can do something about it. And that's Jehovah. That's God in heaven. You see, when it comes to romantic relationships, 
what you do to, and what you do with your box of frustrations, you can either, as we said, ignore it, you can replace it, you can push it to other people, or you can leave it, uh, you can leave with your box and leave the person altogether. But over time, you're going to find out that even though they may get us some immediate relief, none of these solutions actually works. And what God is saying is, before you throw that box at someone else, why don't you try me first? Cast your burdens on me. Bring it to me in prayer. Let that raw, unfiltered emotion, let it come to me. Because if you stay with it, it's going to destroy you on the inside. If you ignore it, it's going to destroy you on the inside. If it goes to your partner, it will destroy them. If that anger goes to your children, it will destroy their marriages before they even begin. And some of us, that's what we do. We talk to our children about the anger we have with our spouse. So inappropriate. We're destroying their future before it begins. And God is saying, bring that energy to the one place that has capacity for it. Bring it to God. Get honest with God. Stop praying polite, formal prayers. Pray those ugly prayers. Real prayers of desperation. Real prayers of, look at what this person has done, God. But here's what I want, to, I want to warn you. Something's going to happen when you start praying such prayers. I want to just promise you, something's going to change. But it may not be what you think. Because when you decide to pray honestly and consistently bring your frustrations to God, God will for sure answer you and He will bring changes. But the immediate changes may not be in the person you're praying for. <laughs> they may be in you. Now, you might be saying, wait a minute, I'm not the one with the problem here. <laughs> it's not me who needs to be changed. But you see, God sees what we can't see. And he knows the attitudes and habits that are informing what's in your box of desires that are standing to frustrations. Now, I'm not saying that your desires are wrong. I'm not saying that it's wrong for you to have these legitimate desires. My point is that when you consistently bring your box of frustrations to God in prayer, God might begin to change your view of at least four important areas in life. And the first one is your dreams. You know, you may begin to see that this box of dreams, your hopes and desires, you might start to see it very differently. You might start to even take out some of the things in this box and realize maybe they were not as important as you thought. Maybe they were not as life-defining as you thought. Um, should I throw the baby? No, let me throw the money. Uh, it, it, it's, like, it's like this is not as important as I thought. You might find that, you know what, as much as I, I was hung out about this and I've always thought in my life this was the most important thing, it actually isn't. And you begin to understand certain things about dreams that God begins to speak to you about. Because he made you and he knows what's best for you. The second area you might start to change is your view of yourself. As you pray, it's possible that you're going to find that your dream had stacks of, of it had a lifestyle. And you're putting your pressure on your, on your spouse because you feel they're not pulling their weight and delivering the, the lifestyle you want. But if the real issue here is that you, you, it might be that you saw your parents struggling financially and that you have serious fear of lack that is causing you to struggle to trust anyone, including God. And what if God, as you pray, begins to show you that in your eyes, you trust yourself and your abilities more than you trust God? And what if God shows you that there's a brokenness inside you and that you are inadvertently asking your partner to fix what your partner can't fix? It's a brokenness that needs to be fixed. And God might actually help you start to understand that it's you that needs changing. A third area that might change as you pray is your view of your spouse. You know, as you pray, God may reveal some of the weakest, weakness, brokenness, defects, ugliness that is inside your partner. But the crazy thing is often it's not the obvious ones you saw on the surface. I mean, maybe you are, you are praying to God because this guy is so stubborn. He never, die, he never moves when he's supposed to move. This girl is always late. Regardless of what I do, it's like she never changes. Those are the things you're seeing. But deep down, God might start to show you the things that are hidden deep down in your spouse. Their fears, their anxieties, their self-esteem issues. And God might help you stop seeing them as a defiant and vindictive person. And help you to realize that on the inside, just like everyone else, they're a broken human being in need of compassion, empathy, and ultimately prayers. And instead of fighting them, you start fighting for them. Come on, somebody. I mean, it's so powerful when you move from fighting your spouse and start fighting for your spouse because you understand how needy they are and you understand that maybe God put me in relationship with this broken person because they needed someone to love on them, to pray for them, to help them become everything that God wants them to be. So that's the third area that might change is your view of your spouse. But the fourth area and an important area that God may give you insight is your view of your God. You may discover you've been trying to squeeze things out of your husband or out of your wife, 
or you're out of your fiance that they were never able to give. It's not theirs to give in the first place. You've been pushing them for security. You've been pushing them for a sense of identity. You've been pushing them for unconditional acceptance. Something that only God can give you and something that your father actually desires to give you if you would just turn your attention to him instead. See, these are the, fa- the amazing things that happen when you start to hurl your frustrations to God. And that's why David, at the end of this psalm, he says in verse 22, he says, cast your burdens on the Lord. In other words, release your burdens. He will sustain you and he will uphold you. You see, when we throw our frustrations to God, the final thing God does is he sustains us and he upholds us through the season of life that we are in, in our marriage or in our relationship. So, I mean, you could be like everyone else. You could choose to, look, I'm in frustration right now. My marriage is in so much pain. My relationship is in pain. I'm going to either ignore it or or replace it or push it to someone else or leave with my frustrations. But that's a one-way ticket to destroying your relationship. Or you could be like David and hurl those frustrations to God in prayer. Invite his power to work in your heart and in the heart of your partner and see God begin to shift things and move things and give you heavenly perspective on your relationship. And so this week, I want to give us some homework as I come to an end. So far, we've, do- we've talked about the gratitude challenge, finding things that you appreciate about your partner. By the way, that was not just for week one. I want to just continue uh, finding things to say thank you, unusual things, things that your partner does that you are taking for granted, and now you're finding ways to say thank you. I've also asked you to list what's in your box and even to ask your partner what's in their box. Now this week what I wanted to do is make an honest list of all the frustration, for those of you who are married, especially uh, in a relationship, of all the frustrations you have in your marriage. And then take some time to talk honestly to God about them. And let me just say, as people make this list, uh, those of you who are single, I've found that many people who are single have been applying this message and finding dramatic shifts in their other relationships. So maybe the relationship that's stuck in your life is a relationship with a parent. I want you to do the same thing. Just make that list of all the things that frustrate you. And then this week, just take time to hurl those things. Talk to God as honestly as you can about those issues. Now, uh, uh, let me just say this as before I pray, that we have an amazing event coming up for married and engaged couples uh, in March, this coming month. It's the Noah Festival. It's going to take place March 16th to 18th, 2023. It's going to be a great space to get even deeper in this conversation. And I want to just check it out on our website and reserve your space early. And then invite all your friends who are married, engaged, uh, because this is going to be just one of those life-changing spaces that's going to help all our relationships become everything that God wants them to be. And next week, I'm going to be concluding our series. I'm going to be talking about, let me just say this, it's probably the most important choice that any coupled person can make in the course of their relationship. I mean, we're ending on a bang. We're ending with on a high, with a bang. And so please, you don't want to miss this one. Invite your friends, even if they've not even been following the series, invite them to be part of next week because next week we're going to be ending with an incredible hack, a life hack for relationships. And it's going to be one that's going to help you in your marriage relationship, in your, in your relationship with your friends, your, your family members. It's going to be one of those that's going, it's just a life-changing hack and you want to be there. You could save a marriage, so invite someone want to come with you uh, to church next week. So allow me to bring this to a a close and just pray for us as we conclude. Father, thank you for your children. Thank you because you love us. Thank you because, Lord, it is you who's giving us your word and that, Lord, you're helping us to understand the things you're calling us to as a community. Loving relationships, relationships that build one another up, relationships that attract people to God as they watch us relate in love to one another. I want to pray for anybody who's been dealing with their frustrations by ignoring them, by replacing them, by pushing them onto their, their partner, or even by leaving, because there are some of us who even left our relationships to find solace somewhere else. But Lord, I just pray that you'd give grace to us as we reflect on this, your word, and help us to understand how to apply it in this season. I pray for you, especially if you're in that situation where you've even left your spouse, maybe you're even separated right now, and God is beginning to speak to you right now. I want you to, I just want to pray for you that God will give you the grace this week to bring those issues, cast your burdens on the Lord, and he will sustain and uphold you. And I just pray that, Father God, as we do this, as we practice this powerful word, that Lord, none of us would remain the same. Bless us in our relationships. For we ask this in Jesus' mighty name and God's people say, Amen. See you this Wednesday, family night. God bless you. I come before you today. And
See you. 